Why are you coming forward? Why are you speaking out? Um, so I had no intention of speaking out and, and making these particular details of, of my marriage public. Um, I feel as though the the opportunity um, to to share my experience with other people and talk about the the shame and the guilt um, that's associated with it and then also the healing and resiliency that comes after you've been able to step out. You hope it hel helps other people. It was really important for me, yeah, to be able to get that message out to other people. This isn't a, a vendetta against your former husband. No, and I've tried very much to make that clear when I was speaking with, with other media outlets that I have nothing against Rob. I have long since done the healing and forgiveness that I needed to, and I, I seek no harm for him. Let, let me take you back. The You were married, uh, the marriage started, I think, November 2009. That's correct. Um, the abuse, the verbal abuse, started on your honeymoon. Um, even sooner than that, actually, um, we had a delayed honeymoon, so within the first probably two weeks, um, I was already getting belittled and um, nitpicked and sort of systematically torn apart for, for small things and, and seeing glimpses of his anger. You said he, he, was curse, he would curse at you? The cursing, the actual cursing and insults didn't start until the honeymoon, which was about a month or so after we were married. H had you gotten any hint of that during the dating process? You know, I, I hadn't. He is quite charming and, and chivalrous and romantic and um, the way that he described his previous marriage, it, it all added up to how he was behaving when he was with me and so the only possible inclination that I had to a glimpse into his anger was uh, at one point a month or so before we were married when um, he was particularly impatient. We were late for an appointment to meet with somebody and it just seems like a, a little bit disproportionate to the situation. But even that wasn't a red flag for what I experienced ultimately. You, it was uh, just a few months after the, your honeymoon uh, in June, I think of 2010, that you actually uh, filed for a, a temporary uh, protective order. Yes. Can, can you talk about the incident that, that motivated that? Yes. Um, Rob and I had been seeing a marriage counselor and together had drafted a separation agreement um, primarily because of his anger and the, the verbal and emotional abuse. Um, so at that time he was meant to be living in our home that we had recently purchased. He came to the apartment where I was staying and refused to leave. And after he did ultimately leave and I closed the door and locked it behind him, he returned a moment later and punched in the glass on the front door. Um, and because I did know that, that his anger was unpredictable, I, I didn't know what he would do next. And I... Um, you were frightened? I, yeah, I was scared. And you called the police? And I did call the police. Was it the police who recommended the protective, temporary protective order? Yeah, I, even in that moment, you know, when my husband had just punched in the glass on my door and made me scared, I, I didn't realize the extent of, of what I was dealing with. And thankfully there was a police officer who sort of counseled me, you know, you didn't think that he would punch in a window and now he did. So you don't want to know, you don't really know what, what could happen in the future. And um, with that counsel uh, and ultimately counseling with um, a Mormon bishop, the, the lay clergy in the Mormon church, I, I decided to file the temporary protective order. Uh, you, you had written on a blog post about, about the counseling with the bishop and one of the things the, the bishop had sort of suggested to you or, or, or mentioned to you is do you want to file this temporary protective order mm. because of the impact it might have on, uh, on your husband's career? Yeah. How did you feel when, when that was brought up? I was taken aback. Um, it seemed sort of not <laughs> the priority in the situation that I was discussing. Um, I hold no ill will towards that bishop. I think he was making a decision the best that he could with the information that he, that he had, but ultimately I think it shows some of the, the nuances of, of what someone goes through when they're in an abusive relationship that because I was unable to clearly articulate the fear that I had and to clearly articulate even some of the, the um, more extreme forms of emotional or verbal abuse that I was experiencing, he really didn't understand the severity of the situation and was able to, to make that as a recommendation. One of the things um, the, 
you didn't know his uh, his ex-wife, his first wife. No. So you didn't know the uh, the allegations that that what, what she had said, the the choking, the the, no. the assaults. I was unaware of that at all. All of which, of course, he he uh, de denied and continues to deny. I'm wondering. Um, at a certain point, though, you were arguing, and there was a, a you said there was a physical, uh, I don't know how to describe it, confrontation of sorts. Yeah, the, the first and, and perhaps the only physical abuse that, that I suffered was after an argument where we were both yelling in each other's faces, which unfortunately had become the norm in our marriage, and I removed myself from the situation uh, to take a shower. Uh, to, to cool down, to disengage from the situation, he uh, came to the shower and opened the door and 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 pulled pulled me out uh, to continue yelling at me. He put his hands on you and pulled you out. Yeah. F was that startle Was that a, a startling moment for you, though? I think up until that moment, um, I, I didn't I didn't realize that I was in an abusive marriage. Mm. I, I think that sounds almost ridiculous coming out of my mouth given how I can speak about it and, and remember things now, but I don't know, it was until that moment that I, that I realized I was with a man who was capable of something like that. I, I think so many women will relate to, to, to the, what you just said, and, and one of the things you wrote, um, you wrote about, you, you talked about how when you would go outside, people would compliment your husband and say how lucky mm -hmm. you were to have a guy like that, and, and sort of his public face was an incredibly impressive one. Did that add to that sense of not being able to believe what was going on at home? So, I mean, I think you kind of hit on the crux of how I ended up here in your studio, right? Like, there is somebody who is able to rise professionally and have um, the accolades from so many, and even in the face of, of what's currently unfolding, to still have the support of so many people in the White House and, and former colleagues, that the idea that he could be so different seems to escape people. Um, and yet, everyone in their daily lives has a, a, a different personality for, for different situations. I think this, for Rob, is just a really extreme and, and um, toxic version of that. You had said, um uh, strangers complimented him to me every time we went out, but in my home, the abuse was insidious. The threats were personal. The terror was real. Th that's what it felt, a terror. It was an, a low-grade, constant terror of not knowing what I might do to set something off, um, what mood he would have. Um, there weren't any explicit threats, but I, but I frequently felt threatened. There was one other thing you wrote, and then I want to take a break uh, for, for a moment. You wrote, if he was a mon about why you stayed, if he was a monster all the time, perhaps it would have been easier to leave, but he could be kind and sensitive, and so I stayed. He cried and apologized, and so I stayed. He offered to get help and even went to a few counseling sessions and therapy groups, and so I stayed. Yeah, you know, this is a question, I, I specifically wrote that because that's a question that I'm asked a lot is why, why did you stay if he was a, a quote unquote monster and, and the reality is he's not a monster. He is a intelligent, kind, chivalrous, caring, um, uh, professional man and he is deeply troubled and angry and violent. I don't th think those things are mutually exclusive. And the people he works with may not have seen that side of him at of all. Of course not, of course not. It's reserved for the, the most intimate and most vulnerable moments in his life. Um, Porter's first wife, who you hadn't met, Col uh, Colby, reached out to you, I think in 2017, after the, the FBI had interviewed both of you. When, when you started to hear her story, when you actually met, I'm wondering what that experience was like, because I mean, th she's alleging numerous acts of physical abuse, of choking, uh, you know, being pushed down on a bed, held down, a, a knee placed on her, uh, and obviously there's the photographs of her with a black eye. Yeah. First of all, I, I just absolutely am in awe of her and her bravery and willingness to share that as publicly as she has. Um, when we met in March of 2017, after we had both had to sort of rehash our experiences with the FBI, um, it was, it was almost like a, a, 
a, a long time validation mm. because obviously being in that relationship, um, I, I knew on some level that it wasn't me and that Colby had to have experienced similar things even though Rob manipulated the story of his marriage about her several times, I knew it had to be similar. And so when I met her and she described the, the insults and the, the systematic tearing down of everything that we knew to be true about ourselves, I just immediately thought, oh, I wasn't alone, you know, because deep down I had known that. And that must have been an extraordinary feeling to realize, wait a minute, this is not me. This is, this is, yeah. has happened before. Yeah, and I think a lot of people in abusive relationships, because of the, the constant, insidious um, breaking down of that confidence and of that even knowledge of sense of self, start to, to believe that it really is something that they're doing or something that they in some way deserved uh, because of their choices. And um, for, for me, I, I think I just sort of accepted it once it became the norm and, and I, I lost a lot of confidence and just accepted that's what it was. Mm. And it took years <laughs> to, to get past that point, but it took meeting Colby and really hearing her story and sharing my story and us both going, yeah, yeah, that happened to me too before I could really recognize the magnitude of when it. When you saw the, um, the, the photographs of, of her with the black eye, um, which Rob Porter said he took the photos um, and that the story behind it is different than what she is alleging, uh, Colby says actually she has now said, well, she actually, yes, he did take the photos because she actually made him take the photos as sort of an act of contrition uh, after, after uh, she says that he punched her. But I'm just wondering when you saw, actually saw those photographs, did she show them to you? She didn't show them to me. When we met in March, she did tell me that they existed. So, she... so this, that, seeing the photos is new to you? Yeah. I'm wondering the, how, that, how that impacted you. You know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel lucky that um, the abuse that I endured wasn't like that. Mm. Even when she told me some of the things that she experienced, it was almost like an abstract reality. Um, until I'm, I'm seeing it and, and hearing her, her accounts of it now. And then another woman reached out to you uh, more, more recently, is that in 2016, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So, uh, so uh, was that after the FBI or before? No, that was well before. I um, was contacted by a woman via Facebook. I don't know her, we don't have any mutual friends. Um, in February of 2016, um, I was traveling internationally, and so I, I didn't correspond with her very much, but she essentially reached out to me saying that she was in a relationship with Rob. She had been for several years and was experiencing abuse and feeling crazy and felt that the people she had shared with didn't believe her and that she was isolated and alone. Um, and she wanted to know uh, if she was. <laughs> Am I alone? Am I crazy? I think were her exact questions. Was she looking to get out? of the relationship? Uh, it seemed in her correspondence with me that she had recently ended the relationship and was just feeling the extreme deflation that comes with that. You've, you've been exhausted and, and on this heightened adrenaline for so long in a relationship like that. I think she was sort of feeling that, that drain and that exhaustion. However, um, I did find out a couple of months later when she had contacted me again that they actually were still in a relationship. It, when when the FBI came to you, was it? Uh, to, did you? I mean, did they start asking questions? Uh, did they know about the allegations of abuse, or was that something that they didn't ask me specific questions about abuse? Um, having never done a security background interview of that way, I don't know if there were specific targeted questions, but it seems to me that they did a fairly standard background check and that they were asking me to describe his character, mask, asking me to describe um, anything that I thought might be problematic in his position. And they did ask what was the nature of our relationship, and they did ask um, if I felt that he would be different professionally versus privately. And I was very candid and, and frank and detailed with them um, about my marriage. You, you, uh, you, had been in, you were in touch with, with, with Porter even after the divorce. You, you maintained yeah. uh, 
would you say cordial relations? Yeah. Yeah. Would you actually see him or just talk on the phone? Um, I think once or twice over the four years we probably saw him. Yeah, yeah, we saw each other at least once or twice. Did he know that the FBI had talked to you and was he concerned about that at all? Yeah, so he, because we were in contact, he had actually let me know that the FBI was going to be contacting me and got the information so that they could. Um, and just then, standard procedure. Yeah, yeah, and leading up to the interview, um, he asked me what I intended to say and, and what types of things I would say about him. And I was honest with him about what I planned to say. Um, and after the FBI interview, um, he, want, he wanted to know the same things. What types of things did they ask and what types of things did I say? And so Rob was aware of what I had shared with the FBI. Was he concerned about what his first wife had said? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you think his, his past action should prevent him from working in the White House? That's such a difficult question for me to answer. Um, and I've been asked it multiple times and mulling it over. And it's sort of a, a greater question, I think, for society today. You know, can we separate um, a man from his mistakes, if we want to call it that? Or can we separate a man's work from his private life? Um, and for me, especially now that I'm feeling more empowered that I've told my story, that I'm sharing details that even my closest family and friends didn't know and I'm sharing that publicly, I'm feeling more and more empowered that we need to have a conversation that anyone who is manipulative or abusive of power or abusive in any way is held accountable regardless of what they contribute. And it's really concerning to me that that's what the discussion has been is, well, but what did, what did Rob contribute? What was, his, what was his work? As opposed to, you know, this is a, this is a troubled man with issues that, that needs help. I wanted to ask you about a couple of things the White House has said um, and about what they've done or have not done. Um, Chief of Staff John Kelly uh, said Porter is, quote, uh, a man of true integrity and honor. Um, that's what he said uh, earlier yesterday. They now say they only became fully aware of the allegations yesterday. And then when asked today about what changed between when the first statement was made and, and a later statement, they said uh, it was, quote, the full nature of the allegations, particularly the images. Do you think it should have taken the White House seeing images of, of Colby bruised and battered to come up with a different statement? You know, I feel like that's a that's a speculative thing that I can't really answer, um, just because of the, of the of my closeness to it and the nature of it. But I do feel as though, um, knowing Rob the way that I do, he he probably is able to even even if his clearance hadn't gone through and they knew that it was because of problems in his marriage, I think he was probably able to spin it in such a way that it was minimized, that it was downplayed, and I. I generally believe that uh, Chief of Staff Kelly thought that it was lesser than it was and seeing those photographs, I wish that my um, interview would have been enough, but seeing those photographs sort of solidified that no, this is in fact an issue. Yeah, it's still not clear because the White House won't answer what General Kelly knew when he knew it and, and to what extent he knew about uh, about the 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 reports, the allegations that, that both of you uh, had, had made. Um, there's this new statement now from General Kelly where he said he was shocked by the, quote, new allegations and there's, quote, no place for uh, domestic violence. Is it important to you that somebody like General Kelly believes your story? It's important to me in general that anyone who's coming forward with a story like that is, is believed up front that it's not on the burden of proof for me or anyone else to, to justify those claims. And that the, the conversation around abuse or assault or even misogyny in general doesn't automatically turn to, well, he's really great. Could it possibly be that she's exaggerating or she's not telling the truth or it's not as bad as, as they're making it out to be? Because there's there's very little evidence that any woman would bring that kind of scrutiny upon themselves to share these types of details. I, I didn't ask for this. I would never have shared these types of details as publicly if the media hadn't come to me with this moment to do that. 
The, the statement that uh, Rob Porter issued reads, these outrageous allegations are simply false. I've been transparent and truthful about these vile claims, but I will not further engage publicly with a coordinated smear campaign. Is this a coordinated smear campaign? No. No. I, have, I had no intentions of, of disparaging Rob. I had been in contact with Rob a lot in the last two weeks as he um, gave me some warning that, that stories might break and, and knew that people might be sniffing around my blog post. Uh, he, he warned you that, that this might come out? Yeah, yeah. Was he concerned about that? Yeah, he had asked me multiple times to take down my, my Instagram uh, post. You had done a blog post where you hadn't named any names. No. You had just talked in general about right. your experience. Right, right. And um, I, had done, I had done so with the intention of, of reaching people who may need to hear that message and see what it's like on the other side, you know, to have that hope. Uh, and Rob was aware of that post when it originally went out a year ago, a little less than a year ago, and again asked me to take it down two weeks ago. Um, I think in anticipation of, of me being questioned about it. Did he ever ask you to deny? Your no, own. we were in contact uh, even a couple of days ago as he was asking me to release a statement um, about my blog post and I went back and forth with him for an hour or so about what language I would be comfortable with and ultimately the language that he asked I, I wasn't comfortable with and can he came out with that statement less than an hour later. Can you say what he wanted you to, to say? Um, uh, I don't remember the exact wording but it was something along the lines of the post does not accurately depict uh, my marriage and there were there were some other things that were associated with it and that just didn't feel right to me because it does accurately depict my marriage and uh, another thing that he wanted me to say was that I had taken some liberties with this therapeutic post which it was for me mm -hmm. that I had taken liberties with that therapeutic post and when I thought about it I, I didn't the things that I said were, were factual statements it the, does sound like he was asking you to deny what you had he was asking me to downplay it yeah. And he was asking me to um, emphasize more the relationship that he and I have now as opposed to what I experienced in our marriage. Have you talked to him in the last couple of days? I haven't. No. I haven't spoken to him since that conversation. The, um, Rob Porter is now in a, in a relationship with the White House Press Secretary, H Hope Hicks. Do you think he's changed? I, I don't think he's changed. Does that worry you? It worries me for a lot of reasons. I mean, it definitely worries me because if I'm being frank with you, if he hasn't already been abusive with hope, he will. And particularly now that he's under a lot of stress and scrutiny, that's, that's when the behaviors come out. And if he hasn't already, he will. You think he can't, he has not gotten help, he can't stop at this point? I don't think that he has done the self-reflective work to acknowledge this issue. I don't think that he has um, really taken the time to to deconstruct why it is that he behaves this way and until he's able to do that I don't know that he has control over it. So you're saying you're worried about Hope Hicks? I am worried. The I, I, I read part of this before but You'd said that after three years of marriage, you were a shell of a person, a muted version of the woman I had been when I met Rob. Can you talk to me about recovery for this? Because there's a lot of women right now who are in situations, uh, trapped in situations. Don't men feel, and women. Men and women don't feel they can get out. And I'm wondering how you moved through it and what your message is to them. Thank you for asking that. I think that's one of the primary messages that I want to, to, to get out and since I did have to share my story. And it's the idea that when you're in that relationship, just the idea of sharing those details is exhausting and overwhelming. And it doesn't necessarily take one instance to convince someone to get out. Over the spectrum of abuse, the instances start to, to run together. And so my, my message is one of, if you feel as though your personality has been muted, as though your livelihood is, is, is not at the level that it had been or that it could be, something is wrong in your relationship. Something is toxic in your relationship. And I don't know that we need to attribute blame and call 
one person an abuser and one person uh, a victim or one person a monster and one person a victim, I think it's a matter of recognizing that something is severely broken and going to get the help that both of you need. And for somebody who's on the receiving end of any type of abuse where they're starting to feel like they're losing their sense of self, the moment of recovery comes when you recognize that you have no control over that person's behavior. And what you have control over is your own choices and how you react to them. You don't use that term victim. I don't. I don't feel like I was a victim for a couple of reasons. The first is I chose Rob, you know, and subconsciously, whether I can pinpoint it or not, I, I chose him. And, and so there's something that I needed to work through in that. Um, I'm not saying that it was my fault that I ended up in that marriage, but I acknowledge that there, there was something in me that allowed me to accept it as long as I did. Um, and so in that way, no, I'm not a victim. And, and Rob is abusive and Rob is, is flawed and definitely has anger. I think he might also suffer from depression and, and the anger is, is the outlet for that. But he's not a monster and he's not an abuser in that that is what he should be defined as. I don't believe that. Even though he was, you say he was abusive. And yes. his former wife says he was abusive. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the reason that I'm able to, to say that and, and feel that is because ultimately I do believe in redemption. And I do believe that if or when Rob is ready to do the work that he needs to do, um, he can be he can be a good man and he can be redeemed. And that's not on me and it's not on me to own. And I don't want to seek to to judge or to hurt somebody who is in that position because God forbid somebody judge me in the mistakes that I've made and in the, the life choices that have brought me to where I am. Jenny Willoughby, thanks so much. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to say? No, no, thank you for having me.